So um, tonight's tonight's lecture, um, it's a little bit different from uh, what was advertised due to staff availability. Uh, we have had to change uh, tonight's lecture, but hopefully you are all uh, notified about the changes. Um, but tonight's lecture is all about um, foundation training uh, as a doctor. So we're joined uh, by Dr. Jordan Watson and Dr. Um, Emma Hill. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about them and then I'll, I'll hand over uh, to them. So Dr. Hill is a foundation year two doctor who did her undergraduate medical degree at BSMS and a master's degree in medical education at Newcastle University. Uh, she's now working in South Yorkshire where she makes the most of the nearby countryside to go exploring on her days off. Um, and Dr. Watson is also an FY2 from the same undergraduate medicine cohort at BSMS. Um, he has an intercalated degree in neuroscience from Imperial College London and is now working on the Isle of Man. Um, in his spare time, Jordan enjoys traveling, politics and getting out into nature and is in the process of moving to Australia. Um, at which point I will hand over uh, to Dr. Watson and Dr. Hill. Um, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see so many of you here. Sorry about the change of programme, but hopefully you'll get a lot out of this evening. Um, like Zach said, I'm Emma. I'm one of the doctors uh, from BSMS who is now working up in Sheffield. I'm just going to share my screen so that we can get started. So I've put the slido.com website in the chat. And if you just input the number code that I've put in there as well, that will allow you to ask questions at any point during the um, session this evening. And at a couple of points, I'll put on a few polls so that we can get some uh, interaction with yourselves going as well. It's all anonymous. None of us can see who's typing what. So feel free to share any questions on there if you don't want to put them in the chat under your name. So. What are we going to cover this evening? Uh, we've got a rough outline here. So the main thing is about mine and Jordan's personal experiences of being a foundation doctor, because I think before medical school, that's what I was really lacking was an insight into what actually happens after that. We talk a lot about how to get into medical school and what medical school does, but we don't think about our lives beyond that very much. So we're going to focus quite heavily on that. But before we get there, I'll give you a bit of an introduction to the training pathway after medical school. Jordan's going to speak about the application process um, for postgraduate training, uh, and then we'll go into a bit more detail into our experiences. Um, we're happy to answer questions as we go along, but there will be dedicated question and answer time at the end as well. So thinking about the kind of training pathway after medical school. So Medical school is obviously the first step in becoming a doctor, um, and that's what we call gaining your primary medical qualification. So uh, this is your undergraduate degree. For most people, it's about five years long in, for the course. If you're a graduate, you might do only four years. Um, if you want to add in a degree like Jordan and I did um, and do either an intercalated bachelor's degree or a master's degree, then you might spend six years at medical school um, to include that extra degree as well. So after you leave medical school, um, you'll be added to the provisional register with the General Medical Council, the GMC, and they oversee the training of all doctors um, at the postgraduate level, as well as the undergraduate medical school training. So you get provisional registration, which means that you're approved to enter a foundation training job. job. So that's what Jordan and I are doing at the moment. Uh, in the UK, the foundation programme is a two year course. So they're split into foundation year one, FY1, and foundation year two, FY2. The foundation year one, you're very heavily supervised. There's a few rules about things you can't do because you're only provisionally registered with the GMC. Um, but, one, but other than that, it's very similar to the FY2 year. At the end of the FY1 year, you'll be granted full registration with the GMC, providing that you've met all their criteria for the foundation year one training. So that's completion of three four month rotations um, or the equivalent if you're doing part time. Uh, it involves completing a portfolio where you have to log all your learning experiences from the workplace. Um, and it also involves submitting a few other bits of paperwork. Once you're fully registered, you can then do your FY2 and you get a bit more kind of freedom to sign legal documents. Um, you can prescribe in the community as well as in the hospital, whereas as an FY1, you can only do it in the hospitals. Um, and it just kind of puts you on a higher level of autonomy within your own clinical practice. So you have a bit more decision making resting on your shoulders, whereas in FY1, it's it's mostly supervised. Um, 
kind of you don't make any big decisions on your own at FY1. Once you've completed your FY2 training, you can then choose whether you want to apply to any further training or you might choose to digress. So Jordan's going to cover that a little bit later on. But uh, the kind of main pathway from leaving medical school to becoming a consultant, which is the most qualified doctor, is the one we see here. So that's what I'm going to focus on. So after foundation training, you might apply to your core training. So different specialties have a different training pathway and they all are slightly different lengths of time and involving slightly different um, kind of criteria that you have to meet to progress at each stage. But essentially core training is the point you have to pick roughly what area you want to go in. So whether that's surgery, whether it's medicine, whether it's general practice, psychiatry, and then there's a few odd ones that kind of do their own thing. So pediatrics and anesthetics, you can apply for those at that point as well. After you've done a few years of your core training, you then pick your specialty training. So this is the kind of more niche area within the first area that you've chosen. So say you chose surgery at the core training stage, you might do core surgical training and then say, actually, I want to do general surgery, which is kind of the guts and things to do with the upper and lower digestive system. Um, so that's the point when you would make that decision. Um, and then you do a few years further of training within that specialised area to then receive your certificate of completion of training. So that's called um, getting your CCT. And that's at the point when you become a consultant. So it's quite a long training pathway in terms of the number of years it takes. We've mentioned between four and six years for the primary medical qualification, two years for foundation training. And then core training is anywhere between um, kind of two and three years. And specialty training is another kind of three, four years on top of that, depending which specialty you've chosen. So it takes a long time to become a consultant. And it's a lot of time of working, but also training alongside that, which can be quite difficult. Um, and that's why we require quite a lot of commitment um, if you want to apply to medical school. OK, thanks, Emma. Um, hi, as Zach said before, my name is Jordan. I'm also an F2. Um, so I'm just going to talk a bit about applying for the foundation programme. So after five, six years of medical school, um, you start applying to on, on this national system called Oriel. Um, so it doesn't matter which medical school you go to, you all apply on this one system. Um, depending on your rankings at medical school, so that's from your exam results, you'll be ranked from one to 10, um, plus any degrees that you get um, or publications, you'll get a set amount of points for this ranking. Um, so that's 50% of the ranking. The other 50% is one exam that you sit at the end of the medical at the end of medical school called the SJT, so the Situational Judgment Test. The system that we have in now, just bear in mind, things do change. Uh, so this might not be the system that's in place in five, six years time. Um, so everybody, no matter what medical school you're from, you all apply in this system and you'll put uh, a preference down for different areas of the country. So the Northwest of England, for example, areas of Scotland, um, you get into that area, so that deanery, and within that deanery, you then apply for jobs. And depending on your overall score will depend on how likely you are to get those jobs. Um, depending on how competitive the area is, um, with jobs, people can rank hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of jobs. Um, and it all just depends on what you get on your SJT for your uh, situational judgment test score and your rankings throughout medical school. Um, it's... Many people are very critical of the process. Um, I know the vast majority of medical students don't like it, um, but it's a system that's in place to ensure that areas of the country don't have the, the, the better doctors. Um, it sort of um, randomizes us across the whole of the British Isles, um, which in theory benefits patients um, and patient care. So here's our first little interactive bit. So if you could all go to slido.com, if you've got access to that um, and put in the pin code and I will just um, find, I'm gonna make the poll go live. So imagine that you've just finished medical school and uh, you're about to start your first shift as a doctor. What sort of feelings do you think you might kind of have what things might come up for you as you're about to start life as a doctor so you've got a lot of nerves excitement anxiety apprehension
Yeah, so I would definitely agree that I felt those things before I started. Um, an element of fear. Uh, you're not sure quite what to expect, especially if, like me, you end up working in a different place to where you trained. Um, whether you've chosen that or not, it's still quite nerve wracking to be in a different place with different processes that you need to learn, as well as learning how to be a doctor more generally as well. Um, but it is very exciting. It's something you've worked several years, at least four. Um, I went to medical school for six years, so it had been a long time coming by the time you start. And it is quite exciting to be able to put into practice um, the things that you've been studying at medical school. Yeah, I'd say with um, throughout medical school, medical teaches you medical school teaches you how to pass medical school, and you only truly learn to become a doctor when you're practicing as a doctor. So that first day, nothing can really prepare you for that. They can prepare you as much as they possibly can, but it's that added responsibility. It's that independence um, that throughout the whole of medical school, you're so supported in that clinical environment. You don't have any responsibility. Um, and so nothing can really prepare you for that. So the anxiety, I don't know of anyone who wasn't anxious or nervous for the first day, for the first weeks, months. Um, but there is an element of excitement, I think, after six years, six years is an awfully long time. Um, and it is great to finally, finally get there, really. And I know my first day, so I started my job on weekends, which means there's less staffing, fewer seniors around. Um, things tend to be just that little bit busier because there are fewer other um, medical staff around other allied health professionals are not as well staffed either so there's just that little apprehension about lack of support there um, but it was very exciting and there's always people around if you need them so it can be a bit daunting if you you find you're the only one around but there's always people at the end of a phone um, or the kind of notorious bleep we can bleep our seniors the same way that we get bleeps on our little paging devices um, so, yeah, I remember feeling quite scared about lack of support at a weekend on my first shift. But actually, it went really well in the end. And likewise, with my first shift, it's sort of one of those horror stories. Um, when I went in at 9 a.m. Um, on that Wednesday morning, the first Wednesday, so Black Wednesday, as they call it, in August, when there's the changeover. And my first patient, I went in, a nurse grabbed me on the ward and said, come and review this patient. Um, we have this score called a news system. So it essentially tells you how unwell a patient is. And to put it into perspective, if a patient's scoring above three, they need review. And this patient was newsing 11. Um, and I go in and I could barely feel a pulse. I was panicking. I ran out to grab the consultant. And they're so, at this point, they've been used to doctors who've been there all year, the F1. So at the end of F1, they've been a doctor for a year. And I was panicking. And he said, oh, just get ephemeral stab. So that's uh, an injection within in the groin. And I thought I can barely take blood, let alone do um, ephemeral stab. So I was petrified on my first day. Um, but after a while, you do get comfortable. You learn there are people that you can contact and that can support you. Um, but it's not, yeah, it wasn't an ideal patient. My first ever patient on my first day as a doctor, not having a pulse. Yeah, I was lucky. I didn't have that on my first day, but come day three, I had a very similar situation. The consultant did come, but he was a surgeon. He just said, stick her on some oxygen and then left. Um, so I was just left with this really unwell patient with no plan other than maybe give them some oxygen. Um, but like Jordan said, there's always someone you can call uh, the friendly med reg in the hospital. Um, so that's the medical registrar. So they're one of the senior doctors um, in medicine rather than surgery they tend to have a better overview of um, patients health as a whole rather than surgeons who focus very specifically on what they're used to seeing um, so there's always someone you can ask and they have to give support the med reg did save me I, I went to the med reg panic stricken and he swanned in and saved the day so it was okay and they know that everyone at the start of August, which is when we all rotate, everyone's scared, everyone's new to the job, nobody really knows what they're doing. So everyone expects to have to help a little bit more around that time compared to usual. Um, so thinking about the day to day tasks that a doctor does, I'm not sure I really thought about this much before I was actually at medical school. Like you have this vague idea of a doctor being somebody who diagnoses illness and treats it, but you're not really sure logistically what they get up to in their day. So I'm going to start another poll. 
and see if we can work out what sort of things an F1, F2 doctor might do. Yeah, so we, we've got some really good examples here. Um, so ward rounds is nice and big in bold writing. So a few of you have said that. That is a key part of being a doctor. So uh, every day there will be a ward round of some description. Um, depending on the specialty, it might be run slightly differently. So I found that on surgical wards, they're very senior led. So either the registrar or the consultant will do a ward round of all of the patients. Whereas on medical wards, it tends to be split up among the junior staff with consultants seeing patients two, three times a week, depending how unwell they are. Um, so that's a big part of being a doctor is doing those ward rounds. So you go and see the patient, you review all of their observations. Uh, you might uh, recap on the history of why they're in hospital. You'll examine them to see how they're getting on, whether they're improving or deteriorating. Um, and you'll come up with a plan based on those things uh, and based on investigation results as to where we go next and hopefully eventually get them well enough to go home. Um, what other I things? Think, yeah. I think it's interesting. Um, breaking bad news is a big one. Officially, an F1 is not supposed to be the doctor who breaks bad news to patients, though what it says and what happens in reality are two different things. So often in the afternoon, the consultant, the registrars have left. You're the only doctor there that um, family members and patients can talk to. So you find yourself um, breaking bad news a lot of the time um, when it comes to some kind of awful news, um, life changing news. Often that's reserved for the consultants um, and a multidisciplinary team approach to that. Um, but yeah, it's a big part of the job, especially um, I found in elderly medicine. Um, when you're working with lots of patients with end of life care, um, it's breaking bad news is part of the day to day job. Thanks, Jordan. Um, what else have we got here? So taking blood tests. Yes. Um, kind of known as a blood monkey um you go around taking bloods usually what i found quite interesting when i first started as a doctor bearing in mind in medical school i could get away with having only done bloods a handful of times uh, you then become a doctor and suddenly if the nurses can't do it or if the phlebotomists who are the people who take bloods all day every day if they can't do it it then comes to you to do it so i found that quite difficult when i first started out because i didn't have the experience but i was having to do it on the difficult patients more than the average patient um you do get a lot better at it very quickly um and you can also learn quite cool skills to do it as well so my first job was a surgical job a lot of the patients are dehydrated they don't have very big bouncy veins because they haven't got enough kind of fluid in there um so i used a lot of ultrasound guided cannulas so um using the ultrasound machine to visualize where the vein is so that i can do it without having to be able to see it with my naked eye or just by feel. So that was quite a fun thing to learn. Um, some patients have long term lines in, uh, especially those who either need feeding without going through the gut or if they need um, long term antibiotics, they might have a line put in. So then we can take blood tests from there instead of using a needle. And that's just a bit nicer for them. It saves them having lots of needle pricks uh, and it preserves the veins as well so that we don't keep damaging them by going in for blood tests. Um, so that is a big part of it as a junior. Um, there is a lot of paperwork. Um, a few people have mentioned that in different ways. There's way more paperwork than I ever truly anticipated. Um, I think I spent about two hours this afternoon just writing up notes because it takes that long to write them. Um, different trusts have different setups. So mine at the moment is paper based, but uh, we're hoping to move online, but it means that we're at that awkward stage where you kind of got a bit of both, which means you end up duplicating the work because you have to write it on the paper system and also on the online system. Um, so there is a lot of admin. Um, and as you develop in your career as a doctor, there are different types of admin. So as an FY1, FY2, there's a lot of discharge letter writing. Um, which is done on the ward, a lot of prescribing medications, um, both for discharge and as an inpatient. But as you get more senior, a lot of the admin is more writing emails, referrals, um, typing up clinic letters, that sort of thing. Jordan, anything to add? 
no, I think that that's pretty much covered it. Lots and lots and lots and lots of paperwork. <laughs> pretty much sums, sums it up. Uh, a few people have mentioned here about checking vitals and blood sugars and blood pressure readings, things like that. We do sometimes do that. Usually I ask the nurses to do that if I need those informations. It, it's their bread and butter. It's what they do all day long. Um, whereas I tend to interpret them without necessarily being able to do them myself. It's not that I can't do them. It's just that the nurses can do them. And when you're stretched between lots of different patients, lots of different wards, it's often useful to get the nurses to do what they can do so that when you see the patient, you've got all that information ready without having to do it. Someone's also put audits. So yes, um, there are the GMC's guideline for kind of teaching doctors includes things that are outside of normal clinical medicine. Um, so there's things like audits and research, teaching, um, leadership and management. They're all considered key components of being a doctor. So even though it's not necessarily the day to day, it is stuff that we have to get involved with. Um, and yeah. The level of involvement depends on your interest, but you have to at least be shown to show an interest in each of those things. Yeah. OK. Um, I just have a lot of pictures because I don't like text and writing. So I'll just be talking through um, my experiences um, how I got to foundation program and um, what life's been like as a foundation doctor and beyond. So if that's working. No. There we go. OK. My story. Oh, no. Hello again. Okay, so my story so far. So I'm from Brighton. Um, some people on this talk might have been involved with the Bright Med program. So um, I grew up in Bevendine in Brighton. Um, I was part of the Bright Med program um, from 13 to 17. Um, I went to Cardinal Newman and then Baswick in Hove. Um, I got my A levels and I started BSMS in 2015. So that photo on the right is me on my first day with my flatmates. Um, during the middle of medical school, I did an integrated uh, degree in neuroscience and mental health at Imperial College London in 2019, and then went back to BSMS for two more years um, when I qualified as a doctor in 2021. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm quite, I'm not your average foundation doctor in that I'm not actually working in the UK. Um, I'm working on the Isle of Man. For those who don't know, it's a small island nation between Great Britain and the island of Ireland. Um, it's part of the foundation program, though it's not strictly NHS, um, but it works exactly the same as the NHS. It's just a matter of where the funds come from. So um, I chose to come to the Isle of Man for my foundation training because I wanted a smaller hospital. Um, the pay is also slightly better here as well. So uh, I'd gone to medical school in Brighton I'd done work in London I'd lived in big cities but for foundation training um, it's often better being in a smaller hospital just because you get to do a lot more and for those who don't know um, the Isle of Man is famous for uh, the TT so this is the um, most dangerous motorbike race in the world and on the island um, myself and the 23 other junior doctor uh, 23 other foundation doctors we all live um, in the same accommodation block um, and that's us in the bottom left hand corner um, on our first week when starting. OK. So. Oh. OK. Sorry about this. Um, so jobs of a foundation doctor. So we've spoken um, about this before, but I'll just reiterate anything that hasn't kind of come up or I think is important. So um, on the left, as Emma said, the. Um, she was the blood monkey, I was the cannula monkey. Um, different centres um, have different skill sets. Um, unfortunately, we qualified during COVID um, and lots of the more experienced nurses were put onto COVID wards. Um, I started on an acute medical ward in which we didn't have any phlebotomists. None of the nurses could take bloods or cannulate. So from my first day, I was expected to do every single one of them for our 20 patients. Um, yeah. Um, so second in the middle, so ward rounds. I didn't truly understand what a ward round was um, before starting medical school. And even going into my clinical years, I only learned what a ward round was when I actually went on one. Um, for those who aren't aware, you go around with a consultant um, and other members of the team. It might be a registrar, it might be a nurse, occupational therapist. And you go to each patient and you create a plan. 
And then it's your job in the afternoon to implement that plan. So the consultant, the senior is often only there um, in the morning and they'll essentially say, I want this done, this blood test, I want this scan ordering, I want you to discuss with the family. And then your job is to implement that plan. Um, so my jobs as a uh, foundation year one doctor, so I worked on an acute medical unit. So um, for those who don't know, after A&E, if they're medical patients acutely unwell, they go to the acute medical unit. Um, I had a trauma and orthopedics job um, and I had an elderly medicine job. So my eldest elderly medicine job, lots of it was end of life care. Um, and that involved lots of discussions and meetings with physiotherapists, occupational therapists, Lots of you might have heard in the news about um, how big bed blocking, um, how big of a problem it is in the NHS. And what you find is working on elderly wards is that lots of the patients that, as we call, medically optimised for discharge, but it's about putting those plans in place to get them um, either the care they need at home or um, whether they're going to a care home, residential, etc. cetera. Um, a few of the other jobs. Um, so bottom left-hand corner, um, I've different centres again some are online some are written I must have rewritten a thousand if not more drug charts um, that's just one of our jobs um, and it's our job to prescribe on behalf of the consultant lots of the time so they'll say I want this antibiotic give it for five days you go right in the drug chart and um, again gloved finger on the elderly ward as the F1 um, it, lots of the patients are constipated um, and it's your job to do the digital rectal exams, not the most glamorous job in the world, but um, you have to do it. Um, I also had an A&E job for four months. And so additional things, for example, citrine for people that come in, came in with lacerations. And that bottom right picture is just me at the end of the shift for the whole of my F1, F2. Um, I think it's Voldemort, okay. All right, uh, and if it's done again. Oh, um, one thing to note is that I think lots of people think doctors don't have lives and that everything is work, 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 but we are also people with our own lives too. So I just put this slide in to show, even though I feel like I've been so overworked and underpaid and it's been a really difficult couple of years, I have also had a life outside. I've been on holidays, I've gone to concerts, had things with friends. You do dedicate lots of your life to the profession, but you are still a person with interests outside of medicine. And that's so important because those who don't have don't have that the ones who burn out down the line so I, I just thought i'd include this to show we are also human um we might work like robots a lot on the ward and be tired overworked but we do have a life outside of medicine and if you go into medicine make sure that you do too okay um i think it would be a sort of injustice to have this talk without talking about the other things um beyond just the role of a doctor. Before starting, before going to medical school, I didn't realize how closely linked politics was with medicine. Um, lots of, you hear on the media, I'm sure lots of you have heard about junior doctor um, strikes and pay disputes um, and talk of pay restoration. Um, lots say at medical school, oh, we were told to expect to have our pay cut. We were told to expect to be overworked, underpaid. Um, that's not something that I, really took from my early years at medical school or even before then. Um, so for example, at the moment, the graph on the left is showing how much junior doctors pay has been cut um, since 2008. This actually only goes to 2021. So that's now gone down to 30% pay cut. Um, at the moment, junior doctors across England have been batted um, for strike action. And it's looking like that's going to go ahead. Um, I think what I will say, being a doctor, it's, it's a privilege being a doctor. It's incredibly rewarding. I, I've had such amazing experiences with patients, um, especially on my elderly placement with end of life patients. It's an incredibly humbling thing to do. And you have connections with amazing people and you can positively impact on their life. However, if you are going into medicine because you think it's going to be well paid and an easy ride, it really, really isn't. Um, and for those, of my colleagues whose parents push them into medicine, I will say those are the ones who drop out and can't cope with it because it is vocational. Um, lots of it is vocational, though many of us are still pushing for full pay restoration. Um, and during the pandemic, we were seen as martyrs, um, but 
there is definitely a movement and burnout has never been so high. Um, so the NHS, or at least foundation training that you might expect to have in however many years it would be until you're an F1, F2, the NHS will be very different. Um, whether that's better or worse, we can't really, I can't comment on that. I do hope over the next few years, things change for the better. Um, but for example, pay, um, we were talking before, um, I'm in a unique position in which I'm probably one of the highest paid F2s in the country because I'm not in the, I'm not in the United Kingdom. Um, but Emma, for example, gets paid £2,200 a month. Um, it might sound a lot when you're 14, 15, but after seven, eight years of training um, and considering how much work you put into it, it isn't, relatively speaking, a lot of money. Um, I didn't truly appreciate um, the impact that not earning for six years and then having a not very high paid job after that would have on things like buying a house and other things. So what I'm saying is, if you're doing it for the money, do not do it for the money because that's a really stupid idea. Um, there are so many other degrees and career paths that will earn you money. This is not the one. Um, I think I'll also add at the moment, I'm in the process of moving to Australia, to Melbourne. Um, and myself and many of my colleagues are doing the same. Um, but I do hope that there is a lot of change in the next few years. And I think we're pushing for that change so that your cohorts in the future as well don't have the same experience of having their pay cut um, again and again, um, year on year. Um, and I do hope that working conditions also improve with regards to staffing as well. I thought I'd just talk about that. It's, a, it's not very pleasant and people like to put rose into glasses when um, thinking about applying for medicine, but you can't, you can't think about applying without thinking about the economic implications down the line as well. Okay, I think that's my, my uh, experiences slides over yeah that's great thank you jordan um so i'm going to speak a little bit about kind of my journey into medicine uh which jobs i did and what i got from those and then i'll speak about kind of what my weekly timetable looks like and what my rotor shift pattern looks like someone's asked about rotor shift patterns so i'll speak a bit about that and then i'll give you some of my kind of personal highs and lows of uh foundation training so far um, so similarly to Jordan, uh, I went to state school. Uh, I then applied to do medicine at BSMS, which at the time was my local medical school, having moved around as a kid uh, around the country. Um, so I stayed in Brighton for the five year course. But halfway through that, I went up to Newcastle and lived there for a year where I did my master's degree. Um, and then finished up my medical degree down in Brighton and decided actually I wanted to move a bit further away, have a bit of freedom from family and um, kind of explore a new city. So I decided to come up to South Yorkshire for my foundation year training. Um, and I have really enjoyed being up here. I've met loads of new people, uh, lots of new experiences, and it's got some lovely countryside as well. So it's been really good for um, kind of my personal life as well as for the medical side of things so in terms of my jobs my first year I was in a district general hospital so like Jordan said smaller hospitals are often actually better for your foundation training because uh, you see a lot more stuff and you get a lot more hands-on very early on so if I take, for example, one of my friends uh, did her FY1 year in Manchester, in one of the major hospitals of Manchester, and I was doing it in a little district general hospital in Doncaster. So as Jordan mentioned earlier with the new scores of kind of a scoring of how unwell a patient is, my friend in Manchester would see them if they were scoring between a three and a five, uh, whereas we were so busy in the district general hospital and there were fewer staff all around that I was only really seeing people above a seven and actually often seeing people in the 11s, 12s, 13s just on my own because you are the first person that the nurses can contact. So you get a lot more hands on early on and the registrar, who's the senior doctor, will come and see them after you've seen them and put your plan into place already. So I got a lot more experience with unwell patients and managing acutely deteriorating patients than my friend did in her big hospital in Manchester and that means that I actually learned a lot very very quickly whereas she was struggling to get experience with things until a bit later on in her career. Um, 
I started on general surgery, which was a bit of a baptism of fire because surgeons are very good at their surgical job, but have forgotten most of the general medicine. So as the FY1 on the ward, you're responsible for all of the patient's healthcare that doesn't relate to their surgery, which is quite a lot of their healthcare in an aging population with lots of comorbidities. Um, so the job that I had, uh, we had the opportunity to go to theatre if you wanted. I wasn't particularly interested, so I just stayed on the wards. But that meant that I had a really good relationship with the nursing staff um, and with the other staff on the wards. Often I was the only doctor on the ward with 31 patients. So as you can imagine, after ward round, even if you only generate one or two jobs per patient, that's a lot of jobs to get through on your own um, while the registrar and the consultants are in theatres operating. But I really enjoyed it, had a great time. Um, then I moved on to elderly medicine. So older people with lots of comorbidities. As Jordan said, there was a lot of end of life care in that job, a lot of breaking bad news or having difficult conversations with family members. Um, I also had a kind of outbreak of COVID on our elderly wards at that time. So a lot of the conversations had to be done over the phone or in full PPE, not just me, but also the relatives. And that makes communicating quite difficult. So it was tough emotionally at that point. Um, but in terms of the team, they were really friendly. Jerry's tends to attract, so geriatrics, elderly medicine tends to attract people who look at patients holistically and have an understanding of their kind of um, their psychosocial well-being as well as their physical health so that was quite nice to be around people who think of patients as a whole person and not just as the problem and um, so that's what I gained from that then I moved on to A&E which is very practical and very exciting at times uh, I managed a few patients in recess so as an FY1 you do get the opportunities to do those things but they're very heavily supported so I would see patients in the recess room so that's the most unwell patients will go there I could see them and put in into place a plan but if I needed anyone A&E is very senior heavy so there's always consultants or registrars around you that you can grab to ask for a second opinion or to have a look at somebody or to take some bloods if you're struggling so it's very exciting because you get to see lots of different things and practice all your skills but it's very supported at the same time so that was a nice job for me as Jordan said you have a life outside of medicine I managed to get uh, three separate holidays in during my a &E rotation so even though the shifts are long and hard and the rotors can be awful there is opportunity to have a life as well so don't forget that um, then I moved on to my FY2 year. Uh, I started on OBS and Gynae, so that's women's health. That's uh, mostly looking after pregnant women, either in early pregnancy if they're having issues um, or in later pregnancy and delivery and labour. Um, it's a very practical job. You get involved with surgery. Um, you can get involved in cesarean sections. Um, depending on your level of interest, you might be doing them almost entirely by yourself by the end of the rotation, obviously under supervision, but you can do each of the stages. It's quite a simple operation as surgeries go. So it's one that as an FY2 doctor, you could definitely um, get experience of. You can uh, practice suturing of the skin um, as well as all the other normal jobs that you get as an FY doctor. Um, it again can be quite emotionally difficult, especially when there are issues around stillbirth or babies that are born with fatal anomalies that mean that they're not going to live for very long. So it's quite draining as a job, but it's actually very fast paced a lot of the time and you can get very hands on. My current job is in paediatrics, so that's children's, um, which I find very exciting. There's lots of practical skills um, and you need to be very good at them because if you think about things like taking blood tests, it's all made 10 times harder when your patient is particularly small um, and you have to kind of zoom in on a vein that's only a millimetre wide. Um, you can also do extra procedures. So as an FY1 and 2, you're expected to be able to do bloods and cannula on an adult. You don't have to be able to do them in children and you don't have to do any kind of 
more serious investigations like lumbar punctures, which is where you put a needle into somebody's spine to drain some of the fluid off. Um, but those are things that you can do if you want to. So I've been learning how to do lumbar punctures on little babies. So I'll do them on babies who are just a few weeks old um, to check whether they've got meningitis. So it's there's a lot of opportunity for kind of personal and professional development in each of those jobs. Um, I feel like I've rambled a lot. It's difficult when I can't see anyone. <laughs> Um, so in terms of what the week looks like, so I'm talking now about my current job, um, which is in paediatrics. So this timetable gives a rough idea of the sort of things I get up to in a week. So mornings are usually taken up with a ward round. So that might be just a normal ward round where I'm seeing patients on my own, or it might be the post take ward round. So the take is what we call seeing new patients. So if you're on take, you're the one seeing new patients, taking the history, examining them and starting the plan. And then the post take ward round is the kind of morning after they've been admitted, a consultant will go round and see all the new patients to give a senior led plan. So often they'll take a junior with them to do the writing and do all the bits and bobs along the way, like prescribing or requesting uh, investigations and reviewing investigations, but they'll be the ones making the decisions. So that's done in the morning. From the ward round, you'll then have generated jobs, which have to get done um, at some point during the day. So that might be all the things we mentioned earlier. So it might be uh, digital rectal exams. It might be taking bloods. It might be requesting imaging, reviewing the results of imaging or blood tests, um, prescribing, writing discharge letters. Um, all of those things will take up most of the day. Um, as you can see on this weekly timetable, I've put for Tuesday that I might be on something called medical daycare. So in my job currently, that is the place where outpatients will come for a, a an investigation or a test or an infusion of a medication that they have to have every few weeks or every few months. So what I do as the junior doctor there is I will um, see them when they first come in. I will check that they're well enough for whatever procedure they're going to have done. I will examine them to make sure that they've not got any signs of infection. Um, I will see, so for example, um, sometimes we have allergy testing. So I will make sure that they've not got any current signs of allergy. So any current eczema or any current hives that might um, interact with the test to give us a different answer to what we're expecting so if they've already gotten a reaction we might delay the allergy test until that's cleared up um, and then you'll review the patients throughout the day if they become unwell with their infusion or with their allergy test then I might prescribe some medicines to help settle that um, and then it it's often very nurse-led so the nurses will only let me see people if they're worried about them otherwise they're capable of doing it themselves we do also get the opportunity to go to clinics. So sometimes that's a teaching opportunity as in for our learning and the consultants or registrars will teach us in their clinic. Or um, this week I've got my own clinics of jaundice clinics. So that's babies who have become a bit yellow after they've been born. I will see those babies do various tests to rule out any sinister causes of that and then I'll be in charge of chasing those results updating the families and getting any further investigations that we need and I'll end up taking the the lead for that patient's care as an outpatient so I've got one at the moment who has had various investigations and some of those have brought back um results that need actioning. So I'll discuss it with a consultant, but ultimately it's my patient, my responsibility. I'll contact the parents and make sure that all the appropriate follow-up is in place. I'll prescribe the medication that they need. And only after I've done all of that will they be discharged from my clinic. Um, on Thursday afternoons, I've got on there that I might be on acute assessment units. So that's seeing new patients, deciding whether they need admitting or whether they can go home. Um, and that's a job that quite often runs over into the evening. So if I'm on call, that is also what I'll be doing is seeing new patients. I'm very aware of time. So I'm just going to skip over that. Um, this slide's a bit of a boring slide to look at, but it's more to prompt me to tell you about various stories. So 
there will be highs and lows of being a doctor. I've only been a doctor now for about 18 months, but I already have a full collection of both fantastic, amazing times that I can remember, like the first time I delivered a baby in a cesarean section and the fact that dads so often cry when that happens. It's a beautiful moment to be a part of. Um, I've also made diagnoses that senior colleagues have kind of glossed over because they hadn't fully listened to the patient and hadn't worked out what was going on. Whereas if you take the time, um, and in this particular case that I can think of using a telephone interpreter and making the time to actually use an interpreter to get to the bottom of the story, and then you can get a correct diagnosis that other people might have missed. That's a really nice feeling. Um, there have also been some low points. I think bottom of the list has to be kneeling in a in a pool of blood on a bathroom floor at about two in the morning after someone's bled out from both ends. Um, that's something you will never forget and the images will be burned into your mind. So if that's something that you can't cope with, then maybe medicine isn't the world for you. Um, having said that, bonding with colleagues on a night shift because so much stuff happens that you would never even believe was possible. Um, it it develops a level of closeness that you probably don't get with your colleagues in any other job. So even the low points for me have some kind of silver linings. Jordan, do you want to add anything? No, I'd say um, you've covered lots of that. We have quite a few questions um, in, in the chat. Um, kind of uh, moving on from the previous slide of your working week, there's a question, what are your shift patterns like? And also um, I'm under the impression that the average working week for an FY doctor is 40 hours, but in reality, it can be more. How does this occur? Um, different jobs um, will give different shift patterns. So a standard medical job, for example, you might be doing eight to five on paper. Um, leaving on time is something that's rare amongst foundation year doctors. Um, so on paper, you might have a 40 hour week. Um, but for example, I'm on GP at the moment, Monday to Friday. And technically, I start at nine and I'm supposed to finish at five, but I go in at eight because I don't have time to do all my jobs. And today I finished, it was approaching six. So on paper, you might do those hours, but in reality, it's different. Um, unlike lots of jobs um, in which it can hit five and you can just leave. Being a doctor, unfortunately, you can't do that. Um, it tends to be that emergencies creep up about 10 to five or just before the end of your shift. Um, also, locuming as well. Many of you might have seen um, lots of stuff circulating online um, because there's such awful um, staff shortages. Um, lots of foundation doctors on their days off and junior doctors in general are um, guilt tripped into picking up shifts um, and cancel plans with family and friends. Um, this has become a, a huge problem and it's one thing that's impacting on um, burnout, which ties into another question down the line. Uh, for example, that we have had unprecedented times with COVID. So, for example, I think at one point I worked 23 days in a row um, without a day off because half the staff were off with COVID. And if I didn't go in, there wouldn't be a doctor. So in those situations, you feel obliged. But it's when unprecedented times, you wonder when it's going to be precedented again, because it seems like all, all times are unprecedented and we are expected to um, give a lot of ourselves and make uh, personal sacrifices. Um, but it just varies. So, for example, A and E, A and E shift patterns are crazy. Um, they're all over the place. So you might have a day shift, twilight shift. So, for example, one of my on my A and E rota, I would work seven days in a row, four p.m. to at least one a.m., and then get a few days off after. So it it works differently. Um, but what it says on paper versus what you'll actually work are two different things. I, I, I will add. I don't know how it works for you, Jordan, on the Isle of Man, but are so. Full time work generally is, I think it's officially in the UK if you work 38 hours or more or 37 hours or more. 40 hours is kind of what we're expected to work as FY1 doctors in theory. In practice, every job will add additional hours onto your contract. So you still have to do them. You can't choose not to do them. So um, my surgery and my medicine job were both about 48 hours a week average and that was contracted um, and then the so I actually had a different experience of A&E because I did it in my FY1 year in a district general hospital there was not enough senior overnight 
for us to be supervised. So we only had in hours rota. So I, and they didn't want to pay us for out of hours. So we only worked 40 hours a week. It's the only job where I've been contracted for 40 hours. The others are usually between 45 and 50 hours per week. Um, having said that, every rota is different. Um, if you so my current rota, there is a natural one week off without any annual leave needing to be taken it's just one week off because there are so many hours during your normal weeks that actually the only way they can make it compliant with the working time directive of average hours is by giving us a week off every four months um so i've got a week off coming up in february and um, so that's quite nice um having said Jordan, what jordan said about locans we are very short staffed i'm getting emails every single day asking to plug rotor gaps so it is draining but you're not obliged to sign up to any of them and if you say no that is a complete answer you don't need to give your reasons um in so theory. well in, 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 theory. <laughs> in theory um you might so i've had experiences where consultants will make you feel like you have to but legally you're not obliged to um, um we have quite quite a few questions um so starting from the top um, as a doctor in these difficult circumstances, what encourages um, so people activities that occur for you guys to persevere and carry on preventing individual burnout? Um, I think, um, as I was saying before, it's important to have a life outside of medicine. Um, I think if you didn't have any hobbies or you didn't have the support of friends around you, you would burn out very quickly and just go crazy. Um, for me, I like going to the gym. I like going on hikes. And that's what keeps me keeps me going. Um, I also like a holiday every now and again, um, but you need to find you need to find a hobby or something to do, because if you don't and work is your life, you will burn out very, very quickly. Um, and it's my colleagues who outside when they come home from work, they don't do anything. They don't have any hobbies, activities. The, those are the ones who burn out, essentially. So it's really important um, because you have to think about your own mental health. I think as doctors, we project onto other people so we're constantly in the role of the caregiver um, and sometimes it's very easy to forget the fact that we are also human we are also patients with our own physical health mental health um, and that's quite often forgotten um, I think anyway yeah I agree you definitely need life outside of medicine and for me I quite enjoy running I'm training for a half marathon at the moment um, and meeting up for friends for tea coffee drinks um just socializing making sure that you do have a support network around you um for me having moved that i have new friends in the location i am but i still have really good friends who don't live close so making time to go and visit them or for them to visit me um i found that that really helps and then linking into the next question what do you think is the solution to exacerbated burnout in doctors apart from pay um so for me personally i was a bit annoyed that the ballot we were given was entirely about pay because I think the pay wouldn't bother me if the conditions that we were working in were, be were better. So if we had a fully staffed rotor so that I wasn't having to plug the gaps on the rotor or I wasn't having to work the job of three doctors just as one. Um, so even in my FY1 year, um, there was a block of night shifts so night shifts tend to come in either blocks of three or four. I had a shift of a uh, block of four night shifts and it was understaffed by uh, so it's meant to be one FY1 two SHOs so that's an FY2 or a core trainee um, and two regs and it was just me and one reg so the reg was covering two reg jobs and I was covering three junior doctor jobs and actually if we just had a few extra pairs of hands then it wouldn't have been quite so stressful and we wouldn't have felt quite so mentally exhausted by the end of it. So I think just fully staffing the rotors and actually getting some funding to be able to do things well. <laughs> I, th I think the conversation about our pay um, and pay restoration can't be seen independent of the working conditions because it's this vicious cycle. If you're going to continue to tell doctors that they're worth 10% than a doctor the previous year, 15% the next year. So we're worth 30% less than a doctor in 2008, for example. If you do that, then people are going to leave and go to places like Australia, New Zealand. Then once they leave, the doctors remaining is even more understaffed and less desirable. They leave. So it's this vicious cycle of 
we can start training more doctors, but if you're not going to pay them, they're going to leave. Um, so worsening conditions results from doctors leaving as well. Um, but they wouldn't leave in the first place if you paid them what they're worth and stopped cutting their pay. Um, it is difficult because I think doctors as well and nurses, um, we don't go into the profession for money. Um, but equally, we're not volunteers. We're not martyrs. We're still employees with our own we want to get mortgages. We want to have other things in life. We want to be comfortable. Um, but if you're not paid the bare minimum of what you think you're valued, then not only does that impact on your life from a financial point of view, but also yourself. Oh, it's Jordan and they clapped out for, for us and they went out and they said, oh, thank you, healthcare work. Oh. You oh, cut oh. out. I'm not sure if that was just for me or whether it was for everyone. I got most of what you said. Okay, I was just saying, in general, when people went out and clapped for healthcare workers, I think it was a really nice expression, and we thought it would bring about change. But I think lots of us feel um, burnt out just from not being able to provide the care that you necessarily would want to. So it's not only pay, it's also you notice the only limitations on what you're able to provide. Um, and sometimes you feel like you're doing the bare minimum for patients, and you feel that that's an injustice to them. Um and that's horrible on you because you want to give the best care that you can. You want to go that extra mile. But when it's so understaffed and you're burnt out and you're doing extra shifts to fill gaps, you don't have the energy or the resources to do that. Um, but I think it's a, it's a good question. It's one that's difficult to answer. Um, uh, we are going to have to finish up very soon. Um, I don't know if you want to select uh, one, one more question to answer uh, that you think would we'll wrap it up nicely. And then if you've got any final words to uh, to finish up. Someone's asked what you're looking for in Australia that you haven't got in the NHS. Um, so my friends and colleagues who are in Australia get paid double what I get paid. They do less work. The weather's better. The conditions are better. Um, they feel that they can actually provide the care for their patients because their wards are staffed. Um, they're not expected to do extra shifts. Um, and that's appealing. I think as well for us, we also have 60, 70, 80 pay worth of debt um, that we need to pay off from our um, student loans. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to return to the UK. I'm hoping by 2024, there's some radical change uh, in the NHS. And I think that will bring a lot of us back hopefully. So I'll just try and answer the few last ones in the chat while Jordan and Zach can possibly wrap up. Okay. Yeah, is there anything that you'd like to say, Jordan, just to, to, to conclude um, tonight's lecture? Yeah, so um, thank you very uh, much, everyone, for tuning in. Um, I think applying for to study medicine is a big decision. And I think it's one, don't take lightly, don't be forced into it, but it's something that's incredibly rewarding. And I hope for you and for my patients and the country that things change for the better. Um, I wouldn't change my, I wouldn't, I'm glad I've studied medicine and I wouldn't change it for the world, but I do hope that things change in the future for, in terms of the conditions and the pay, um, but it is the best job in the world, given the resources to do it. Excellent. Thank you both um, so much for, for coming along this evening uh, and talking about your experiences. Um, all that I've got to say uh, is a massive thank you uh, to Dr. Emma Hill and Dr. Jordan Watson uh, for, for volunteering their time tonight to come and talk. Um, I found it incredibly fascinating. Uh, uh, so thank you very much um, to everybody watching. Uh, thank you very much. And we hope that you enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, you may now exit the webinar. Thanks very much, folks.